All right, well, good morning again. I'm Andy Taylor from Dr. Cog. Um, I've got a couple other of our staff here with me as well on the line. Um, we've got someone monitoring the chat, chat box if you have any issues or questions. Um, before we dive into these slides, I wanted to point out three things as we get started. Uh, the slides are available for download through GoToWebinar. Uh, they should be available under Handouts in the GoToWebinar application pane. Another reference that I'll be mentioning is the MetroVision uh, Growth and Development Supplement, and it's also available there under the Handouts. Uh, we are recording this uh, webinar for those that couldn't join us today. Uh, I'll be sharing that link uh, with those of you who are attending today as well, just in case uh, you want to share this uh, with any of your colleagues. So whenever I start talking about anything related to the region's urban growth boundary or area program, also known as UGBA, I get lots of questions. So it seemed fitting to organize today's webcast around some questions you might be asking about uh, this specific topic, uh, the development classification system. First, it's always worth backing up what's the larger context for this conversation about the development classification system. Then why does the region even have a classification system and what is its role? And lastly, uh, the question that we here at Dr. Cog hope you're asking is, how can local governments help? Before we start into the development classification system, uh, we do need to back up. Uh, this system is just one small part of a larger conversation uh, that Dr. Cog board is just starting about the UGBA. Since the adoption of MetroVision 2020 back in 1997, uh, the region has had a two-pronged uh, growth strategy. Uh, there's urban intensification through the uh, local identification and designation of urban centers. And then there's also managing the extent of urban development, using an urban growth boundary as a tool to help increase density and meet other MetroVision goals. MetroVision's approach towards urban intensification takes shape as urban centers. Uh, since the adoption of MetroVision, uh, 25 local governments have identified 104 urban centers throughout the region. Uh, some of these are well-established centers, others are existing, uh, but also expect to see significant growth, and still others exist today as plans on the books. Uh, what we're here to talk about today, uh, MetroVision helps manage the extent of urban development through the urban growth boundary or area, the UGBA. Uh, this UGBA is unlike those found in Washington or Oregon, there is no state mandate for it. It's entirely bottom-up. It relies on uh, collaboration among the local communities here. Uh, the Dr. Cog board does not seek to preempt or overwrite local land use control. It really has no authority to do so. But it is concerned about the overall urban footprint of the region as it seeks to anticipate and direct growth to help with planning and preparation, and also efficiently phase development to maximize infrastructure investment and to save money and resources for taxpayers. Despite some interrelationship, uh, these are two separate approaches and we'll only be focusing on the man uh, managing the urban extent prong today. Uh, the UGBA program has continued since that time under MetroVision 2020 successor plans uh, since 1997. Uh, you can see some of the covers of the other plans here. Uh, the program is set up to allow local governments to request additional UGBA periodically, especially as new plans extend the horizon year out, like when MetroVision 2035 replaced uh, MetroVision 2030 in 2007. There was an opportunity to request additional UGBA back in 2009, but we were in a, a, a recession and no one applied for more. In 2013, the board would normally have begun another of these UGBA request opportunities, but for a variety of reasons, they punted. They took action to delay that increase or allocation process until after the adoption of a new MetroVision. And as we approach the end of the year, uh, we are anticipating uh, uh, that MetroVision could be adopted by the end of the year. This is what the board's uh, vision of UGBA looks like in this latest MetroVision draft, which is currently out for public review. Uh, with adoption anticipated as early as December, uh, we now have some work to do to prepare uh, for that UGBA allocation process.
The only problem is that this whole UGBA process is governed by rules that were revised seven to ten years ago. Nearly no one on the board was around when these rules were updated. Uh, major changes were adopted in 2009 but have never been applied. If any institutional memory exists, it's of a process that has already actually been replaced. Uh, our staff here at Dr. Cog, as well as that of many local governments, has lost lots of institutional experience with this program due to retirements and other turnover. Uh, so we have to go back through some of these details with our board, uh, revisit them, and revise them if necessary. Rather than making that one large process, we've tried to break it into three separate pieces or buckets. Uh, at the board's October work session, we gave them a briefing on the development classification system, what we're here to talk about today. We shared with them that there are some technical issues that need to be addressed before the model can deliver accurate results that are uh, really what we believe are in line with the intent of the program. We got guidance from them that they're comfortable moving forward uh, with these other two conversations on the slide uh, while some of these technical issues are addressed with input from local government staff. We just wanted to make sure that you were familiar with these other components uh, in case uh, one of the board members here uh, seeks guidance from you or your peers locally. Next week at their November work session, uh, the board will be looking at the relationship of UGBA and annexation, which is part of that, that third bucket on the slide. Uh, we also anticipate that they'll spend several work sessions discussing the allocation request process early next year in that second bucket. So if you were just tuning into this UGBA conversation with this webcast, you really haven't missed anything. And so we're glad uh, to have you on board with us. So here's the existential development classification system question. Simply, why does it exist? It exists because the board continues to make policy statements about the region's future urban extent or footprint. We all collectively need a shared understanding of what land is currently urban. We can't understand the future or our margin to grow without understanding where we are today. To establish that shared understanding, the board adopted the development classification system as part of the MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement, one of those handouts that I referred to earlier. Uh, Dr. Cog's staff built the development type model. Uh, it's a computer model to help implement this system. You'll hear me refer to it sometimes as uh, dev type for shorthand. Unlike some of our other computer modeling work here at Dr. Cog, this model just makes observations about today. It, it makes no forecasts into the future. For those of you who are really curious about how we got here to having a board adopted development classification system, and a computer-driven dev type model. Uh, here's a little history. Uh, before 2006, uh, there was no system. There, there was no model. It was just a process of heads-up digitization uh, coinciding with new aerial imagery every other year. Aside from being uh, a rather laborious process that was prone to some human error, uh, some also complained about the lag, about having to wait for development to actually start going vertical uh, from the ground in order for aerial imagery to capture it in order for it to then get captured later um, through the human uh, digitization process. And so that's what led to a new approach that would use parcel and subdivision data. That approach was used in the development of MetroVision 2035, which was adopted back in 2007, and then the board officially incorporated this system into the MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement uh, in 2009. Uh, most recently, on the far right of this, uh, this graphic, uh, we've taken a fresh look here at Dr. Cog uh, at the adopted language and reevaluated how well our computer model actually implements it, and we've been making some significant improvements. After looking over that last slide, you might be wondering why we've done all this work. Uh, what function does any of this serve? Uh, this serves to make policy statements, uh, in order to make policy statements about uh, the region's urban extent or urban footprint, uh, we really need a common and consistent understanding of what is urban. It's something we can observe throughout the region, and it might not actually match any local classifications you use in your community. 
the role of the system is to provide that consistency in how the extent of urban development is determined. Urban dev type it means land that's currently urban. Uh, in this context, when we talk about urban, we're looking at subdivisions with lots averaging less than uh, one acre in size, also commercial industrial subdivisions, as well as other parcels with larger businesses. Uh, that covers a very wide range of development or region. Uh, what that means practically is that nearly every jurisdiction has some, even if the term urban carries little resonance in your community. The development classification system begins on page four of the MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement, which should be one of the files available as a handout, as I mentioned. Uh, there, it, there's a more detailed description of the urban classification than what's on the slide uh, that you can see on the bottom of that page. But it might also help to see uh, the range of urban dev type with some examples. Uh, under this classification system, a very wide variety of areas are urban. Uh, this includes areas that, that most would consider suburban, which does not have a separate category in the dev type system. So while m m many might see downtown Denver as urban, uh, this also includes areas in our region uh, that are uh, quite suburban in nature. The development, type, uh, development classification system continues onto page five of that MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement, uh, describing four other classifications or dev types. And you might be asking why I get this question a lot, uh, is why do we need these other dev types? Uh, that is, do they really have a function? They don't have a direct role in the rest of the UGBA program, but they are important to how the dev type model plays out using uh, the mapping rules that follow the development classification system uh, on pages five and six of the supplement. I like to break these mapping rules and model down. Each rule or model component is really asking one of three things. What's urban? Does the model really know enough about this piece of land to know that it meets the classification description of urban? What's not urban? Does the model know enough about this piece of land to put it in one of these other classifications? Then the model has to figure out what to do with the gap. How can the model actually judge what's left based on context? Sure, there could be fewer dev types or just one large non-urban category, but at least with these other dev types, we have a concrete description of land that the model can observe as something other than urban. Sorry if this seems a little basic, but um, I really want to emphasize that as the board makes policy statements about the future extent of urban development or the future urban footprint, they're really focusing uh, on the total UGBA in orange on the right. The last few slides have focused on what's currently urban or urban dev type, the purple circle on the left. Uh, sometimes participants in the UGBA program are really only thinking about their land designated for future urban growth in green in the middle there. But the board statements really only make sense when you add in the urban dev type piece. Another way of thinking about it is simply that urban dev type is really important to understanding what's left for future urban growth on the way to that total UGBA number, especially as urban dev type grows or increases with new development. This is just another way of looking at that formula as shapes on a map. Uh, what's currently urban, urban dev type, uh, plus the future urban growth in green is equivalent to that total UGBA. So this is where we ask for your help, time, and attention. Uh, the dev type model is in better shape than it ever has been. Dr. Cog staff have gone back to make sure that the dev type model is following the board adopted language fulfilling both the development classification system and the nine mapping rules meant to implement that system. But that process has revealed some significant issues with the actual language that the board adopted. Uh, there are sometimes some missing or unclear definitions. Uh, humans might be able to handle such imprecision all right, but uh, computer models uh, really do not. Uh, 
There are also a few cases where the mapping rules disagree with uh, the system descriptions. That is, there are actually two pieces of board-adopted guidance that conflict with each other. There are some assumptions about how data comes in that don't match reality. In general, the model relies on, the model uses data on parcels, subdivisions, open space, and employment. In some cases, we're stretching this data well beyond its original intended purpose, and that can cause some issues uh, that, that right now we don't have the flexibility uh, in what's board adopted uh, to deal with. There are also some significant instances where the rationale is simply missing and doesn't seem to align with the intent of the program. I've got one example of this on the next slide. Uh, the board adopted language also has little guidance for local review. We realize that there are going to be issues with the model results, whether it's because of uh, the data inputs or certain edge cases that don't really fit well into a system that relies on computerized judgment. But we have run the model despite these issues. So here's one example. Uh, the board language asks the model to look at residential lot size to determine density. But there are many cases where a large parcel contains multiple dwelling units. Uh, the case shown here is a manufactured home park, but this also applies to many apartment complexes. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, when this system was set up, we really didn't have as robust a data set about housing unit counts as we do today. So the potential fix would be to factor those unit counts in. Here's another example, Sloan's Lake. Um, as adopted, the language is asking us to look at parcels in the open space inventory. But the open space inventory isn't made up of parcels. It's the actual functional boundaries of our open spaces and parks. So if we're judging open space by parcel size, we can get some interesting results. Uh, another wrinkle comes as we're asked to look at open space and subdivisions differently. Sloan's Lake, much like other parks, never went back through a subdivision process to make it one unified parcel. In fact, significant pieces of it were uh, part of different subdivisions uh, that the model categorizes as urban. Uh, continuing on the topic of open space, uh, here's an example of uh, unclear definitions. The supplement asks us to consider everything in our open space inventory. The problem is that our regional inventory is actually an assemble, assemblage of local data. Uh, we do a lot of work to get that data into our schema of categories and types, but still every jurisdiction has their own criteria include in their open space layer. And we're not in, in a position to tell you what to include or not, as your data needs to meet your local needs first, not ours. Uh, so some jurisdictions do include golf courses and cemeteries. Some even include their schools and recreation centers. Some have included polygons representing future or open spaces that don't exist today. And so we have categories and types that would allow us to perform queries and only consider certain types of open space for dev type purposes. It's just that right now the adopted language uh, will not let us do that. Uh, before I move on, I want to stress here that the purpose of including open space and dev type is not to create a definitive open space layer. If we're doing work that requires us to consider open space, we would actually go back to that inventory. This is just a, a process to help, identifying, uh, in, to help in identifying what's not urban today. When looking at non-residential properties, um, there's a first a step to check whether the parcel is in a commercial or industrial subdivision. But then, after that, there's a check for more isolated parcels with significant employment, which also looks to only look at commercial and industrial uses only. However, the assessor's data we use considers many properties as exempt, even if they have significant employment. Uh, in this case, it is a school. Uh, and so these are then skipped over through this process and not categorized as urban currently in the model.
Airports are really kind of their own thing. Uh, our model does really well with parcels that go through the subdivision process. However, airports rarely go through that process to make a parcel or a series of parcels that closely match the specific uses on the ground. Uh, seeing that our major airports represent a limited number of cases, we're looking at a potential fix that would involve custom delineation that, that might not match parcel boundaries. So we've got a number of issues like this as well as potential solutions for these issues. But we want to get local input for proposing changes uh, to the board adopted language and implementing changes to the model. So we're looking for local staff that want to come to Dr. Cog and learn more about these potential issues, these issues and their discuss potential fixes. Um, we've scheduled two to three meetings here at Dr. Cog. Uh, if you're not the right staff person but want to suggest that someone else attend, um, again, I want to remind you that today's session is being recorded so that hopefully anyone can catch up and dive in on November 15th. We're also hoping for a mix of backgrounds and experience. It doesn't all have to be land use planners in the room, and you don't have to have extensive experience with GIS or programming. Uh, we do want a mix of professionals in the room. And so I'll be sending out some follow-up emails about these meetings, but if there are specific individuals you want to make sure get that information, uh, please contact me. And I've got my contact information at the end of these slides. If that wasn't enough of a sales pitch, I, I really just wanted to emphasize three more points. Uh, first, we're trying to improve the system results and reduce the need for local review to go back and address these issues. We want to save some time in that future step by getting some input now. Second, this is a fundamental piece of the UGBA program, what's urban today. We're hoping that participation in this process can help you get a jump start on some of the other coming uh, UGBA conversations. Third, for these technical issues with DevType, the board is really relying on getting technical input. Uh, of the three buckets or parallel conversations uh, that, that are going on with UGBA right now, this dev type piece is by far the most technical, and getting local technical input really allows them to focus their time and attention on other aspects of the UGBA conversation. So we've got some time for questions. Uh, please start typing them in if you haven't already. Uh, while you're doing that, I want to make sure that you have my contact information here. I realize that we just dove right into a very technical component of the UGBA program without a lot of background. Um, we're always happy to, to come out and discuss the UGBA program more generally. So please also reach out to me with any questions you have. Uh, we're also happy to come out and discuss the program more generally uh, with you and others in your jurisdiction. So with that, um, I think we'll move on to questions if we have any yet. All right, well, we don't have any questions yet. Uh, but if you, uh, I'd like to stress, if you have any questions that come up or are discussing anything um, after uh, uh, you look at this material and consider it some more, um, please feel free to email me. Um, I'll make sure to help get you get this uh, these questions answered. All right, so I have one question uh, first. Uh, how is transportation funding affected by the UGBA? So currently, um, the UGBA is a consideration uh, when projects are being screened for whether they're going to be included in the regional transportation plan. Uh, so that is, there are some points that are um, uh, assigned at, through that screening process to just decide what gets included in that long-range plan that goes out 20 years. Um, there are also some points associated in the Transportation Improvement Program, the TIP, 
uh, points that are associated with whether or not uh, a project is uh, inside the UGBA. And so um, there are those two ways that, that the UGBA does have a role uh, in transportation funding. Um, I've got another question here. Um, For the upcoming meetings, um, should staff need to attend both of the two scheduled meetings? Yes, we are actually going to, thanks for that clarification, clarifying question, uh, we are actually going to have uh, different content covered at those two uh, meetings. We're hoping to, to dive into a certain set of issues at the first meeting and at the second meeting have uh, some potential solutions that we may have had some chance to come back and actually test. So we may actually be able to see uh, how that has actually played out, how potential solutions that we discussed at the first meeting actually were able to play out um, with what we can do with the data and the computer modeling. And so we may be able to get a chance to see some of those results at the second meeting uh, and get some report on that, but also maybe dive into some other issues that we couldn't get to at the first meeting. So the third meeting is really there depending on how much we can get through at the first two meetings. This is really a sequence of meetings. If for some reason you can't attend one of the meetings, um, I think you will be able to dive into um, a, the, the second or third meeting uh, if that we have that third meeting um, and be able to, to pick up the conversation there as well. So I have another question. Um, at the last board work session, uh, they did see some of these, um, some of these slides as well. Uh, some of these examples as well. And there was a comment at that board work session about reducing the number of employees from 50 uh, for it to be considered urban um, and whether this was still up for discussion. And I think that's an issue we can get into as we look at, at how that step is handled. Um, that 50 number is a benchmark that I, I've seen in there since even before the development classification system and the dev type model existed. It's really a secondary step after uh, the uh, uh, commercial and industrial subdivisions check first. Um, so that captures a lot of uh, establishments that may have fewer than 50 employees. Uh, that 50 employees number is really just to um, try and capture some of maybe the more isolated parcels that have not been through the subdivision process, but that do have significant employment on them to make sure that those are also captured uh, through this process. And so that cutoff, that number could also be considered for change. It is up for discussion. So another question I have here is that beyond the scheduled meetings, uh, what is the process for updating urban dev type? So right now, what's on the what's on the schedule for um, for the board uh, is they use their board work sessions to discuss some of these uh, complicated issues, um, and so this gets more in depth. And so they are handling some of these other conversations about UGBA, these other buckets, um, but these other pieces also affect the MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement. So what we're hoping to do is have these three conversations with local uh, technical staff, get some input, test these changes, and propose uh, changes to the MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement um, to propose changes to the Growth and Development Supplement as a batch of other amendments um, that also are affecting other pieces that are not just the development classification system. So other changes the board is, is considering and discussing, those may all be wrapped up into a single amendment uh, that they can consider, could consider as early as uh, May or June of next year uh, at the board level. Uh, once we get some, some general buy-in from them as well about how the model is running and some of the technical uh, fixes that we've made, uh, there will be a local review process. And right now, we're, uh, we're going to begin working on a platform that will allow um, feedback to come go back and forth between uh, local staff and Dr. Cog staff a little bit more effectively than it has in the past on dev type issues before it's been changing maps back and forth, uh, sending shapefiles back and forth. 
and we can come up with a, a more uh, a better way to collect and aggregate that input. And so we're working on that as well. So there will be a local review process as well. Um, urban dev type won't be updated until after that uh, local review process is complete and finalized. Uh, we may have some preliminary results uh, before uh, that time. We've had a request um, that we send out a list of the questions that are being asked right now and the responses after the webinar. And I will uh, capture all these questions and uh, write up a response as well just to, to share a more brief uh, summary of the questions and answers. Yes, I can do that. So I'm, I have a question about the data portal uh, for whether that can be a tool to access uh, dev type uh, for other jurisdictions. Um, right now, uh, the dev type data and also the UGBA data is not currently on either our data catalog or in our data portal. Um, part of that is, is due to the age of the data and our confidence in, in some of uh, the currency of it. Um, and so uh, we have been making that available as people request um, to see um, their, their data or for the dev type data for, for other communities. Our intent is to make that data available um, more publicly once we go through some of these process, whether that's through the data portal um, or the data catalog even um, for downloads. So um, the, while the UGBA data might not be available through the data catalog uh, for reasons that I can explain a little bit further um, in uh, the write-up that I'm going to send out with these questions. Um, uh, the data uh, portal will be a tool to access a lot of this data, and there are some parameters. Um, the data portal, uh, for those of you who are curious about the difference between the data catalog and the data portal, uh, the data catalog is simply um, uh, a listing of a lot of the data sets that we have here at Dr. Cog that are publicly available for download. The data portal is a more of a two-way conversation. It's a place for local jurisdictions to upload data so that Dr. Cog can then um, incorporate some of that into our regional data sets. Um, and it's also a, a place where we can share data back out. Um, and because there is a user login, we can make sure that there are certain permissions and there are certain ways for um, certain jurisdictions to see um, their own data or share it with um, the, everyone in the region or just a subset of their neighbors, say, uh, for example. So uh, it's a tool that we can definitely uh, utilize um, and is, is part of our intent um, to share some of this information back out. I'll give it another minute to see if there's any more uh, questions that come in. Uh, but I really want to thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, really look forward to getting some additional input uh, from you as well. So the question here is, um, would any updates to the UGBA occur, um, or would they wait until uh, after urban dev type uh, is complete? Um, there is a process for updating UGBA that's called uh, a self-certification process. And that's just simply part of the flexibility that's allowed in uh, the UGBA process. So this is um, the ability to move UGBA within your community um, to cover new properties, new development. Those kind of updates can occur at any time and don't typically uh, require board action. Um, but if we're talking about updates in terms of the regional allocation process or expansion that's set to occur um, that, that I mentioned earlier about the board delaying until after the adoption of MetroVision, you're correct in that um, there would not be any um, uh, regional allocation process commence until uh, we get this urban dev type uh, extent figured out. Um, we realize that that's a fundamental piece uh, that all the local governments deserve to see and need to see uh, before they can really reevaluate their need um, for potentially requesting additional UGBA. So 
So another question about um, that UGBA allocation uh, process that, that could begin um, as early as July, depending on how the board conversations go. Um, how should the local governments prepare themselves for those UGBA allocations? Uh, based on the, the close comment period for MetroVision 2040. Um, th I think there's two things uh, in this question that I'm going to try and address separately. Um, yes, MetroVision 2040 is, is out for comment right now, um, and we're happy to take comments. Uh, UGBA is mentioned in that, um, and um, the guidance that we have from the board is that, that they do feel it's still important to include in the plan, uh, but they did, uh, through the process uh, in, in reviewing the plan and, and working on this outcome in particular, this component of the plan, they did express an interest in, after the adoption of the plan, going back and looking at these details. So it's, it's there. Um, what they've expressed to us now is that uh, they're not interested in, in rushing headlong into um, a UGBA allocation until after they have a chance to at least reevaluate some of the, the details of how this program uh, is run and operated. And so um, there could be comments that are made about the UGBA uh, through the public comment period. We're happy to see those and, and pass those on to the board as well. Um, those will help us as well through um, this process and this, this uh, conversation with the board. Um, but really preparing for the allocation that could happen in the later half of 2017. I think um, the MetroVision Growth and Development Supplement is a great place to start in trying to consider uh, what the allocation process on the books looks like today. It really is focused on whether or not uh, these growth areas, these future growth areas that, that a community may request, are in represented in a local plan. And so that is um, the piece that, that may require the most lead time for preparation, um, especially if um, that, that amendment or that, um, that comp plan uh, piece is not, uh, that, that land is not currently represented uh, uh, in that area, so uh, in that plan document. So that would be a place to p potentially put some preparation time. Um, and uh, another way to, to maybe involve themselves or prepare themselves, communities can look at um, the board work sessions typically happen the first Wednesday of the month. Um, and the board is looking to take this up um, at their board work session, this topic specifically over how the allocation process is going to go. So um, that may also provide some, some, uh, some insight into um, changes that the board is considering to this process. So another question here uh, is how will differences be reconciled uh, between the Dr. Cog UGBA and a local municipal UGB if there is a mismatch? Um, I, I think this is an interesting question that, that um, I've definitely noticed when I have sent out UGBA data, I do uh, make note that, that this may not represent the most current local assumptions. So there, if, if there is a local UGB and it's of uh, a similar size as to what's uh, currently allowed for that jurisdiction, it may just be a simple process of a self-certified change. That is, part of the flexibility provisions that are in the UGBA, um, a local government could just simply change where their UGBA is located uh, to match that municipal UGB. Now, really, when we're talking about UGBA, it's easy to get kind of lost in, in what's on the map and what's represented on the map. But when the board's looking at it, the, the piece of MetroVision that is typically included UGBA is a table. It's a table that shows values for each jurisdiction and how much area they have uh, for UGBA, how much, what their piece of the overall urban footprint is. And so if those numbers don't match, if for some reason, uh, let's say, uh, the municipal UGB was larger than uh, the Dr. Cog UGBA, then that could be um, motivation or um, another part of local plans that, um, that could drive a local community to request additional UGBA 
as part of this upcoming process uh, for, for allocation and expansion. Okay, that was the last question I've got right now. If anyone's got one more burning question, um, I'll give it a minute here um, before uh, before we sign off. Well, I'm just going to take this opportunity to thank everyone for for dialing in and really engaging us with some some good questions here. Um, I'll make sure to um, send this information out about these questions and answers. Um, please, again, uh, my email is ataylor at drcog.org. Um, if you have any questions that you think of uh, later today or into the future, please let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to help discuss this, or even if it's not um, a question that you really have, but you're just looking for uh, more of a conversation about this topic. Um, again, I'm happy to take those phone calls or even uh, come out to your community and discuss this further uh, and consider your situation uh, with this program and any questions you might have. So uh, with that, I don't see any more questions. So um, thank you for joining us, and um, I look forward uh, to your ongoing participation uh, in this process. Thank you.